Okay, thanks everybody. I've got my timer set for 20 minutes. I've got the five slides. Um, can I just thank Michelle, Adam and Shelley too. Uh, I've enjoyed the presentations. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be working with some people who are like-minded. Um, and I assume that's why different people have also joined in. I'm not going to teach you project management over 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to draw on some aspects of project management. But just before I do that, I wrote that first title um, and I thought that's a really great title and I feel really important having written that title. Um, and then I thought, well, is that more about me and how smart um, I might be? Or is that a better title? Educational agility. I'm a sessional. I've been a sessional for half a dozen years at half a dozen different universities. And nothing I'm about to say or, or share is criticism at all. It's just my lived experience um, with trying to deliver, you know, effective teaching practice and some learning strategies, etc., as best I can. And I've learned to take a lot out of project management in designing some of those different techniques and strategies. So that's why I called it educational agility. Agile is a project management mindset. It's a philosophy. It's not a methodology. It's not a framework. Um, it's a way of incremental development and delivery. It's a way of always focusing on high value outcomes. And I just, in my personal experience, I just question if all of my students over the last X number of years are always getting high value outcomes or are they getting convenient outcomes because we're all good at what we do and we keep doing what we do. And then we had this rapid transition to online with COVID and are we rolling out more of the same or is there an opportunity to actually be agile in how we develop and how we deliver uh, teaching and learning? So that's why I, I changed it. And I think it was Adam and Shelley also used the uh, community practice expression as well, because uh, that's what we are. Yes, I'm a sessional. Um, but I'd like to think I am part of that community and I've got a lot to offer and uh, I'm very invested in my postgrad students outcomes. I predominantly work with postgrads in project management um, and I just wanted to share some of those uh, experiences with you. So basically what educational agility is, if you don't like the word, you know, it's agile, it's adaptive, it's responsive, it's being malleable. Uh, it's been adaptive to change, you know, requirements in a project sense, the scope, the requirements will change. So sometimes we lock those in and we laminate them and we don't change them over time. And that's a traditional way of doing a project, I guess. Um, an agile approach is where we, we know the requirements of scope are going to change. So, you know, education and delivery changed from face to face and we went online. So it's really easy just to copy and paste what we all, always do. So we've got the lecture, we've got the tutor, we've got the workshops, we've got the assessment, and we just continue to do what we do. It's convenient and it's easy, and that is neither good nor bad, it's just my observation, it's my reality. So a good project manager, sometimes not a good project manager as well, um, is looking to, you know, we plan, we manage, deliver stuff, we evaluate stuff, we capture lessons learned at the end of the project um, in an agile sense, where we capture that progressively all the way through. We know the requirements are going to change. Our clients' needs are going to change. And in an agile mindset, we say, well, what's the best approach that we can do? And we don't think over a 12 week semester or a term, we think maybe in the next week or two, and we incrementally develop and adjust teaching and, and learning strategies. Is more of the same the best we can offer? Now, I thought long and hard when I, I wrote that. Um, but again, it's my experience. Uh, my students, I'm speaking about my students, um, as a centre of excellence is the platform that we give them what they expect. Now, I know there's been press stories in the Australian and other papers where some students have questioned the fees they're paying given the transition to online delivery. Um, you know, are they getting what they're paying for? But the third point here is their investment in us, our education, the Moodles, the Leos, the Blackboards, is their investment matched by our investment? Is there a nice reciprocal relationship there? 
and in an agile project management sense, we have this client, this stakeholder, this product owner, um, and that product owner is working intimately with the development team, designing, developing, testing, whatever. Um, and again, I'm just thinking out loud, is there an opportunity for our clients, our you know, product owners, our students, my master's students, to have a closer relationship with us in how their material, our teaching expertise, um, and their learning strategies are actually put together. I know we ask them at the end of each of the term, we have your say, and there could be incremental development and tweaking of different courses, which is absolutely great. Um, but I just wonder, is it a reciprocal, a, a reciprocal equation that is out there? So if we're going to be agile in professional development activities that may improve our teaching, may further develop learning strategies, if I'm being agile, um, I came up with, or I probably saw the expression actually, I, I don't think intellectual curiosity is my word, I just can't think, think where I got it. But if I'm adaptive, if I'm malleable, if I'm incrementally looking to improve how I teach, how I support student learning, I really have to challenge these habits of practice, what we always do. So I worked with learning platforms for six years and they're pretty much the same as they were six years ago. There's the lecture, there's the PowerPoint, there's the resource list, there's the 3,000 word essay, the quizzes, the 5,000 words, etc. Um, you know, the sanctity of pedagogical traditions. Um, yeah, you know, that can be scary changing some of those things because we're all highly qualified. We're all, you know, highly trained. Uh, we've all got lots of different texts, etc., around effective teaching. Um, and moving away from some of those things can be scary. But also, I think it was, Adam and Shelley mentioned somewhere, maybe in the abstract, that, you know, time and money are required for some of these changes. Well, you know, is there time and money to change some of these things? Uh, and again, remember, this isn't a criticism. It's just my, my lived experience. Um, and yeah, I, I worked across a lot of discipline silos that are very protective. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And we're not necessarily going to change because it defines who we are and what we offer. But again, is that more about the silo and the discipline and the academics and less about the students? So as with Michelle, I don't have a silver bullet either. I'm just you know, putting that out there. Um, but I would like to think that each of our, our universities and our units are centres of excellence. That's how I've always thought of universities. So I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and they're centres of excellence. Um, and I would love that to be maintained. But if it's more of the same, I just begin to question myself if I'm complicit in not challenging habits of practice, you know, pedagogical uh, traditions and silos, or am I just becoming part of that? And sometimes as a sessional, I don't always have a voice. I'm not on staff. Um, I'm a sessional, I come and go, whatever. Um, and I would like to be part of some of these changes. We teach change management, but are we ourselves open to change? Do we always practice what we teach? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So here are just some of the, on the current state, here are some of my direct observations. Um, so I work predominantly with students with um, you know, limited understanding of you know, higher education in Australia, perhaps English ability, you know, research, skills, scholarly writing, referencing, et cetera. Um, let alone independent study requirements, you know, over and above the, of the time spent, uh, and even the high level thinking skills of, of Bloomed. So we've got this, this eclectic mix of, of students, and yes, we do offer some assistance, but more about that in a moment. I've just got the chats turned off, so I saw something come through. I didn't want to freak out, so sorry, Michelle. I'll, I'll, it was I'll me trying to freak you out. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it later. Um, so, yeah, at times I am the sage on the stage or if I'm a tutor, I'm, you know, I'm working with the slides. There's a resource list with maybe some hyperlinks and you know, a bit of APA style guide, which is lovely. And I know standard summative assessment, which are 3,000 word essays, 5,000 word essays, etc. And Again, that's, that's my reality. It's not a criticism. It's just what I'm working with. But in questioning some of that. So 
do we, and again, I'm thinking of my examples, you know, as a project management on an educator or whatever, you know, do we offer simulation activities and in practicums over and above just a theory dump in getting people to move from, you know, I know this, I can remember this, to physically doing something with it. Now, I teach both entry level, you know, first, to first year master's students. I've taught um, capstone master's students. And I still question what some of those students might be leaving with. Uh, we get them to do group activities. Now, the challenge with the COVID environment to do group activities and form groups and catch up, whatever. But my experience is we don't teach them how to work in a group. We don't teach them how to problem solve. We don't teach them how to allocate work and set priorities. We ask them to fill in the team contract. We ask them to fill in the team contribution document. But in my opinion, many of them have no idea what that is about. And we don't, we don't teach them any of that. We ask them to make presentations. I've never taught any of my, well, I, I try to, but I'm not getting paid to teach them how to present. It's not part of the curriculum. It's part of the assessment. And a lot of students with international backgrounds and, and, and domestic students haven't got the confidence to stand and present and I don't get animated and talk confidently about something. But that's worth 40% of their grade. Uh, 5,000 word essays. I know no project managers who write 3,000, let alone 5,000 word essays. Um, first essay with one subject, 40%, three and a half thousand words. First subject, first year, master's student, international, limited ideas on referencing scholarly writing. Second assignment, 40%. Two assignments, 80%. Then there's a 20% quiz. Is this moving students from knowing to doing? Is this targeting teaching and learning around maybe the demographics that we have on some students? Uh, critical reflections. Everyone's talking about critical reflections, which is lovely. My students don't know how to write one. So I have to create links and provide examples. They'll give me their personal opinion and it'll be you know, quite concise, but it's not a critical reflection. We don't teach, you know, I don't teach them that. It's in the marking guide, it's in the rubric. They've had no experience with it. Software programs. So I've got students doing Project Libra, using Microsoft Project, using Visio, and there are no materials to teach them any of those things. Here's a YouTube video, knock yourself out, go watch it. And that's 25%, that's 30%. How, how I don't know, I'm kind of becoming speechless, sorry. Um, and yeah, academic support services, I really like this one. All universities offer them. It's not mandatory and many students don't access the support. So the academic writing skills aren't up where we want them. They can't, many can't do a citation. I've seen students graduate with a master's that can't do an alphabetically sorted reference list. So how someone gets through half a dozen, 10 or 12 subjects in a master's and cannot do an alphabetically sorted reference list is appalling. Is that the best we can do? Just wondering about now if I'll ever work again as a sessional. Um, so what it could look like, uh, and I think it was Michelle who might have mentioned something about learning on demand is slightly different to online learning. Um, you know, context rich resources, not historical stuff. And, out of textbooks, and maybe the textbooks are current, but you know, project management has been done to death. Trust me, I've written seven books on the topic myself. It's been done to death. We need currency, we need context-rich examples, we need stuff from industry, we need the investment. Someone has to be paid to go and find that stuff. No, let's just copy and paste what we've done before. Um, you know, scale up the assessment. The first one is worth 10%. It's 500 words and practice doing a couple of citations. Practice a APA, a no reference list and bump it up progressively. Remember the first assessment in one of my units was 40%. Many students failed. The second one was 40%. They're going to fail the unit. They just can't get that back. Um, we could reformat resource list just from a hyperlink journal title Get them to solve some problems, do some bibliographies, you know, um, I know, play devil's advocate, do a mock debate, post discussions on a forum. Many students don't 
do that. Um, you know, present a critical reflection, support them, mix it up, uh, give them an opportunity to kind of dissect the information that we're, you know, throwing at them and some of us just washing past them because we're just doing what we have always done. Um, I'm a big believer with this one. Make it compulsory for them to do an academic, a, a whatever it was called, a, a workshop to do a citation, to do a reference list, to learn how to paraphrase, whatever, to learn how to and not just put a citation at the end of a sentence, but to bring it to life in the sentence and extract one or more sentences out of a citation. Teach them how to write an introduction that is compelling. Teach them how to write a conclusion that is compelling. We don't do that, but they're writing essays. And because I'm invested in their education, here I am writing example introductions and conclusions so I can try to give them at least 10 marks for that and 10 marks for the conclusion. Um, yeah, videos, you know, slideshows, you know, podcasts, all of this takes time and money. I get that. But until someone, you know, steps into that space and says, well, is this the best we can offer? It's going to be the same. And I'm going to have the same conversation next year. I don't know, maybe the year after if I'm invited back. So... Um, yeah, no one's ever really asked for my feedback. So this last point, so I've worked somewhere for three or four years and, uh, yeah, no one's ever asked for it. I once wrote 1500 words of feedback on a unit and I was told not to send it to the lecturer. It was, you know, constructive, positive feedback. I was both lecturer and tutor. I had an opinion. I was told not to send it. So, so. With, uh, oh, maybe seven or maybe five minutes to go. Um, what I want you to take away from this, um, it's not any building frustration I may experience. That's not the takeaway. Um, but in doing professional development, in improving how, you know, how we teach, how we support people, et cetera, um, Look for the high value, not the quick easy, not the quick fix, not what's convenience, not what we know. Um, yes, material may get redeveloped every three years or every five years or when it gets certified, etc. But that's not to say it can't be revised and just tweaked and improved along the way. As a sessional, I've been a coordinator. There's no time for me to do that. And I'm not going to do it for free because I'm a retired project manager who's only ever worked for whatever they've been paid per hour or per day. So I'm not going to volunteer my time, but that's not my responsibility. But if the opportunity came up, yeah, I'd love to be involved in some of that stuff. Um, if we scaffold our students, we give them a competitive advantage. So in my students, they leave with a master's degree in which not only do they know that they can do, and they can write. And they can, you know, write professionally. There may be some English issues, you know, out there, which is fine. But, you know, what is, is my competitive advantage for my students? I'm heavily invested in their learning, maybe too much. Um, but, you know, university is a university. A master's is a master's is a master's, whatever. So where is our unique competitive advantage that we can, you know, promote? Uh, yeah, more of the same. Not an option. It's an excuse. And I'm sick of hearing it. I'm sick of seeing slides. I'm sick of seeing a talking head. I'm sick of seeing a reference list with nothing to do with the list. So people are going to click on, are they going to read a 45 page article? No. Are they going to read, you know, 400 pages of PMBOK, this project management body of knowledge thing that I use? No. Um, so we have to point them in the right direction. We have to guide them as to what we want. The good thing about agile, is this culture of accidental experimentation. It's a lovely expression. We can have a play, we can tweak, we can see what works. And if it doesn't work, cool, we'll go and try something else. Excuse me, Stephen, one minute left. Yep, okay, so, so what's wrong with a bit of experimentation? Um, I've mentioned knowing to doing. Yeah, we can scrutinise what we do, etc. I mentioned that somewhere. We can work together. And again, I really don't get a strong sense of that. Um, in lots of places. I sometimes feel like I'm a commodity, I get used up, and on some level that's really lovely. But if we're all called academics, as someone earlier did, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not contributing. 
And yeah, finally, let's invest. We want high value, what we want incremental, we want adaptive, developing teaching and learning to get the best outcome for our students. And if we do that, we get it for ourselves. The end. So. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I noticed in the chat we have a, a comment there. Sarah um, has made the comment, sessional contract, oops. Stop that. In the barrier, yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what would you suggest, how would you suggest universities bridge that gap? Look, I, I have been both coordinator and lecturer and, and just shooter. And, and when I was a coordinator, I would contact all of the, all of the staff each week and just to catch up. I'd preview what was coming up. I'd give them some examples, whatever. Um, and I got a comment. And, and again, this is, isn't any ego boost, but someone said, Stephen, I've never had a coordinator like you who is so engaged and works with all of us continually. So what I currently experience is one-way communication. Every couple of weeks, there's a post, there's no debrief, there's no walking back through the content. No one's ever asked for my opinion, what I thought about a unit, how it could be improved. So yeah, the gap is there, whoever that was, uh, Sarah. Um, but again, I could put up my hand and ask for that but I don't necessarily see that as my role if I'm a sessional. I want to feel collegial, and I think unit coordinators, heads of school, head of discipline, whoever these people are, who may never employ me again, um, yeah, I reckon that's got to come from the top and create that culture, and I'll have an opinion. Um, interesting, my quite different, yeah. Um, Michelle, great, you've had a different experience. And I um, think that's probably a different leadership. So yeah, oh, yeah no, correct. These, our degree, our uh, head of degree, he takes, he loves, well, he, I hope he does because I've been giving it to him for, you know, 20 years, feedback on this. Uh, you know, he takes and uses feedback. And there, there was quite, I got, I was able to do quite a lot about what I was seeing yeah. that wasn't working. So it's not true for all and it's, no. it can be who you're working with. Yeah, uh, as but I it said, took a bit of lobbying my, to get yeah, there. Yeah, as I said, this is my personal journey. So, yeah, it's uh, everyone is different. So, But uh, I think if you, if you think of yourselves as a team, which is really difficult, and being as a casual academic, I always gave feedback, always said, look, this worked really well, the students didn't get this, this would be something that could work better. Um, I, don't, I did that all the way through, but what I found coming onto the permanent sort of side of it and coordinating... I'll put all that stuff out and some will really appreciate it, but then I get, you know, yeah. crickets from other casual students. But again, too, as a sessional, and, and I'm aware that um, Alicia's waiting, um, and it's my project management background, am I going to do all this extra work for free? So currently I'm, I'm, I'm a one-hour shoot, one-hour repeat shoot, preparation, student emails, and suddenly I'm going to write a big review for the course and recommend 25 changes in my own time. No, I'm not. No. No, so. But, but if I was invited to, or if I was asked nicely, I may well do that. You know, I'm not a scary guy. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Yep. It's it's a very challenging space. <laughs> very challenging space, and you le you you've led on from where from what Adam and yeah. Shelley were talking about around. They found that, as you as you alluded to, it was the the course coordinator, our unit coordinator, or somebody close to them, had to be the lead in developing this um, yeah. cohesive collegial team environment amongst all those who are such interacting a with the students. So, yeah. yep. so lovely meeting you all. I may not be working term three, but we'll see. So.